This lecture is part of a series of lectures for a course entitled The Physics of Diagnostic Radiology. The fourth lecture, MR Imaging, Artifacts, and Safety, is broken down into four parts. Lecture four, part three, covers MRI artifacts. At the end of this module, you should reach the following learning objectives. Be able to define a basic expression for the signal-to-noise ratio. Describe the impact of voxel volume, number of echoes, and bandwidth on the signal-to-noise ratio. Discuss two phase encode artifacts. Distinguish between type 1 and type 2 chemical shift artifacts. Explain two frequency encoding artifacts. So we begin the discussion by uh, going through various MR artifacts, of which there are many. Uh, we won't be able to go through all possible artifacts, of course, uh, but some of these uh, will help under, uh, sort of tie in the relationship between case space and imaging space and will present some of the most common artifacts that occur in uh, MR imaging. Something that we don't oftentimes think about as an artifact, but uh, in fact is an artifact, is noise. And noise is present in most imaging systems, and I want to discuss sort of the relationships of noise, uh, how we calculate or estimate signal-to-noise in MR images, at least in the simplest context, uh, and then discuss ways in which we can uh, increase or preferably decrease the noise in our images. So here's an example image on the right-hand side of uh, an axial uh, T1-weighted head image that was acquired um, many, many times in a row. And you can see, of course, uh, that there's some noise fluctuation as well. So this is a time series of, uh, of acquired images. And the only difference between the subsequent images is, is primarily the noise. We can, for example, look at the signal intensity in a single pixel, and we can see that it'll map out some trajectory where it has a mean value and some variance around that value because of the underlying noise. We can also look at a pixel in the background that has a, obviously a much lower signal intensity, um, and we'll also have a variance associated with it. And the simplest definition of signal to noise, and, and, and it turns out it's not always the most correct uh, uh, expression to use, but it's certainly the simplest expression, just defines a signal to noise as the mean of the tissue signal divided by the standard deviation of the noise. Uh, in this example, for, uh, we could take the mean uh, pixel intensity for a single pixel. Uh, as, uh, in this case, we have temporal information, so we could take the mean as a function of time. And we could calculate the noise signal in the background as a standard deviation of the signal uh, taken across time. Now, in more practical examples, uh, we don't have a time series such as this where the noise is uh, sort of apparent dynamically. We'll more typically just have a single image, in which case we could estimate the standard deviation in a region of interest outside of the object in the background, and that would be representative of the variance of uh, the noise signal. And then similarly, within a region of homogeneous tissue, we could take a small ROI and estimate a mean signal there as well, rather than just taking a single pixel intensity. The signal-to-noise ratio uh, is also more directly related to acquisition parameters that we control. And so we take here an expression for the signal-to-noise ratio and see that it's proportional to the voxel volume. And the voxel volume is just the, the volume of tissue contained in a pixel. We have some in-plane resolution and some according slice thickness, and that tells us that uh, there's a certain volume associated with every imaging pixel. And this relationship indicates that larger voxel volumes will give us more signal-to-noise. Larger voxel volumes also uh, relate to having lower spatial resolution, so keep that in mind. Uh, the second part of this expression relates to the amount of time spent acquiring data. If we acquire lots and lots of echoes, then we are spending more time acquiring data. Uh, and um, the square root of the number of echoes is proportional to the signal-to-noise ratio. And so one thing to recognize here is you would have to acquire, for example, four times as many echoes uh, to double your signal-to-noise, and that could be quite uh, costly in terms of time. Another parameter here that we haven't spoken about too much, but we'll clarify a little bit in, in this uh, talk today, is uh, the bandwidth. The bandwidth is the rate at which we're acquiring uh, the case-based data. And if we're acquiring it at very high rates, that actually will decrease the signal's noise, whereas low rates or low bandwidths uh, will uh, improve our signal to noise. And so this is just an example to better clarify what we mean by the, the bandwidth. 
Uh, recall that when we're acquiring the case-based data uh, in an MR experiment, we're generally acquiring an echo from, say, left to right. And this event, uh, the recording of this uh, echo data, takes a finite amount of time. Uh, so uh, the, ex the experiment, the field of view, the resolution, and so forth, dictate that we need to acquire this line of data, uh, but the gradient waveform itself can be changed in different ways, such that we can move across case space very slowly, or we can move across case space very quickly. What controls the rate uh, at which we move across case space is, of course, the gradient, because the gradient waveform, or the integral of the gradient waveform, is tied directly to uh, where we are in case space. And so if we were to double the amplitude of this gradient waveform, for we could move across case space twice as quickly. Uh, and that's referred to as the as a sampling bandwidth, or it's related to the sampling bandwidth. So this relationship tells us that large voxels will give us high signal to noise, but large voxels are also associated with having lower spatial resolution. We could also acquire lots of echoes, and lots of echoes would give us higher signal to noise, but lots of echoes also mean that our scan times will be long. And finally, we might identify that we could use a low bandwidth to achieve higher signal to noise. But as we'll see, lower bandwidths are associated with more chemical shift, uh, specifically type, uh, type 1 artifacts. And that's the spatial misregistration of fat relative to the underlying uh, water tissues or water signals. Um, we can expand this expression just a little bit uh, to, uh, to uh, be more clear about what we mean by the number of echoes. So recall that in an imaging experiment, uh, we do phase encoding typically, say, in the y direction. But if it's a three-dimensional acquisition, then we may have phase encoding in the z direction. And if our signal to noise is not adequate, having uh, performed the acquisition one time, we could repeat the acquisition several times uh, through averaging and improve our signal to noise uh, some. And so this is just a slightly more detailed expression uh, uh, related to the number of echoes acquired for a particular acquisition. So let's think of some examples here. Uh, for, uh, Dr. Awesome wants to increase the signal to noise by twofold. So you want to double the signal to noise without changing the imaging resolution. So the voxel volume stays the same. How many averages are needed? So we want the signal to noise to go up by a factor of two. Uh, we would have to increase our averages by a factor of four. Uh, because the square root of 4, of course, gives us an increase of 2. So you can see that increasing the signal to noise through averaging is expensive in terms of time. Another possibility is uh, Dr. Chairman requests reducing all protocol times by 50% without changing the spatial resolution. How much does uh, SNR change? Well, if we're not changing the spatial resolution, then voxel volume is fixed, and we have to cut this down by a, a factor of 2, uh, or 50%. So the square root of 1 over uh, 2 is going to be a square root of 2 over 2. So we have about a 70% uh, decrease, or we have 70% of the original signal to noise uh, if we are to meet this specific target. We can think of uh, other artifacts. Uh, noise is obviously a very generalized artifact. We can also distinguish between so-called phase encode artifacts, and later we'll discuss frequency encoding artifacts. The most common phase encoding artifact is so-called the aliasing uh, artifact. And it occurs when the field of view is too small. So picture on the left-hand side here, the outer uh, white box represents the full field of view. It's possible that you could uh, inadvertently designate a field of view that was smaller than the actual underlying object. And the result would be uh, acquiring, uh, the, the resulting image would look something like that uh, as shown here on the right, where you have parts of the underlying anatomy wrapping over or aliasing onto other um, aspects of the uh, anatomy. And of course, this is uh, producing non-diagnostic imaging. Uh, so why does this happen? Well, the gradients are active across the entire field of view and beyond. We may specify a target field of view, but the gradients as hardware components are active, so to speak, over dimensions of about 50 centimeters or even 60 centimeters. Uh, so the spins outside of the specified field of view still see the gradients, and in fact, when we excite a slice, we're exciting all spins in a, in a plane. It's not really just exciting things within the field of view. And so spins outside the specified field of view that are excited still see those gradients. Uh, 
uh, and these spins are misinterpreted as coming from areas within the specified field of view, the specified field of view being the dashed field of view. So if you don't do the appropriate case space sampling and you have too few uh, lines essentially, uh, then uh, you'll, you'll see this resulting aliasing artifact where, where tissue is misrepresented as occurring in the, in the wrong place. So the simple solution is to use a large field of view to reduce or eliminate the aliasing uh, or wraparound artifact. Um, increasing the field of view, however, will actually cost you some uh, imaging time if you're to maintain your spatial resolution. So again, there's, there's always trade-offs in MR. Another phase encode related artifact is so-called Gibbs ringing, and this is spurious ringing around sharp and high contrast edges. So here we see a, a, a spurious ringing, these sort of uh, concentric crescent-shaped artifacts that kind of uh, uh, parallel uh, the outer surface. It's a high contrast boundary, very dark in the background, very bright phantom here. Um, and you get this overshoot, uh, an undershoot of about 9%. So that's gonna be more common in low resolution, high contrast images. Low resolution is key and high contrast is key. And it's predominantly going to occur in the phase encoding direction because it's typical or common to have lower resolution in that specific direction. Acquiring high resolution in the phase encode direction takes more time. You have to acquire more echoes, whereas the resolution in the readout direction is relatively free. You're moving through case space so quickly during readout that going out a few more points is not that, not that costly. Uh, the maximum minimum uh, overshoots about 9% of the intensity discontinuity, and so that's why high contrast uh, in high contrast areas this is more apparent uh, than low contrast boundaries. Uh, you can reduce it by acquiring higher resolution images, uh, so that's a rel relatively simple thing to do, but of course will cost you in terms of imaging time. There's also filtering that can be applied to the case-based data, which reduces the oscillations in the images. And in fact, uh, all the manufacturers use some uh, case-based filtering to sort of over to improve the overall uh, image quality. So here's an axial image through the head, uh, and you can identify some Gibbs ringing artifact here on the patient's right and the patient's left side. Uh, and this could be uh, sort of reduced by either improving the spatial resolution or um, uh, or applying some filters in case space. Um, and I should point out too that this artifact uh, can help you identify the phase encoding direction because typically phase encoding is the lower resolution dimension. That's typically where we're going to see Gibbs ringing. And so here we interpret the, or expect that the phase encode direction was left right as opposed to AP. And here we expect that it was probably AP rather than left right. Uh, let's talk about some frequency encoding artifacts. Uh, one of them that was mentioned earlier uh, in a previous lecture as well is chemical shift artifact of type 1, uh, or chemical shift of the first kind. Uh, remember that frequency linearly maps to spatial position. When we turn on gradients, we get a distribution of frequencies, and that linear change in frequency is, uh, is linear over space. Uh, this leads to the displacement or misregistration of fatty tissues because fatty tissues have a slightly different processional behavior due to chemical shift effects or chemical shielding effects of the CH2, CH3 groups found in fats. Uh, this is going to be worse with lower receiver bandwidths. So the receiver bandwidth we talked about previously is be re re being related to the signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, so the uh, choice of bandwidth affects both chemical shift and the uh, signal-to-noise ratio. So this left-hand image here that we see, we have low bandwidth. It's been acquired with low bandwidth. And as a consequence, you have a relatively large fat uh, water shift. Uh, but also, because you're using low bandwidth moving across case space slowly, you actually have higher signal to noise. And so you have to sort of pick between these two artifacts. Here, the anatomical image of the, of the brain is quite nice, but there is some chemical shift artifact that mis misregisters uh, the subcutaneous fat with respect to the underlying uh, anatomy. Uh, so what are your choices? Well, as we move further to the right here, we've gone to higher bandwidth. This is intermediate bandwidth. Uh, at higher bandwidth, we have a small fat water shift. You can see that the, uh, the fat signal here is well registered with the underlying anatomy, but the downside is that uh, because you have high bandwidth, you're moving across case space very quickly. Uh, you have low signal to noise. So you have to choose a trade-off, and perhaps that trade-off is somewhere in the middle with some intermediate level of chemical shift and a little bit noise in your image, but maybe this strikes the right balance. Balance.
So the solution to get rid of the chemical shift artifact is higher bandwidth imaging uh, will increasingly reduce the chemical shift type 1 artifact, but the consequence, of course, is you'll have increasing noise levels that may or may not be acceptable. This just uh, uh, accounts for the bandwidth that was used for acquiring uh, the images that are shown. We also have chemical shift artifact uh, type 2, uh, or chemical shift artifact of the second kind. We talked about this previously. This is signal cancellation due to in-phase and out-of-phase fat and water within a pixel. So depending on uh, the echo time, uh, fat and water can be in phase with one another or out of phase with one another. This is really seen in gradient echo imaging, not spin echo imaging. Spin echo imaging, you have a refocusing pulse, uh, and that means uh, that these sources of off resonance, such as those arising from chemical shift, uh, are offset. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as an India ink artifact. Uh, if you look at the image on the right-hand side here, where fat and water are opposed in phase or out of phase with one another, you tend to get these dark sort of streaks at tissue boundaries, uh, and you can see them in various places in this image. Um, and as a consequence, it's referred sometimes uh, referred to sometimes as an India ink artifact. This is not, in fact, specifically a frequency encoding artifact. I mention it here just because we were just discussing the chemical shift type 1 artifact. So what's the solution uh, if you don't want to have this chemical shift uh, type 2 artifact? Is to choose an in-phase echo time such that fat and water are in phase and never out of phase or opposed in phase, which is what leads to the signal cancellation. So in-phase TEs with gradient echoes reduce this chemical shift type 2 artifact, uh, which is not seen on spin echo imaging. Here's uh, an interesting artifact uh, that, that occurs in the presence of uh, metal implants, so hip implants, knee implants, and, and, and the like. Uh, imagine that we have spins in a gradient field. We'll have spins on the left uh, have a lower field and process lower, and spins to the right have, are exposed to the gradient field at higher strength and have a higher processional uh, frequency. And so we get a linear variation in processional frequency. Now, in the presence of severe off-resonance uh, and an applied gradient, something interesting can happen. You still have a linear change in, in resonance frequency, but this spin here is seeing two effects. It's seeing the effect of the gradient, uh, but it's also seeing the effect of the severe off-resonance, which is arising from some nearby metal or something like that. So the result is that these two spins may in fact be processing at the same Larmor frequency. But remember that spatial position and frequency uh, are a linear mapping, and so this presents an interesting artifact wherein the spin that should be reporting from this position is, that, is actually processing as if it's coming from a different position. And so those signals uh, will overlap and superpose, and you'll get very bright signals in some areas. Uh, but then there will be areas, uh, this position for example, for which there's no spin reporting, there's no, uh, no spin processing at that frequency, and you'll end up with signal voids. And so the combination of applied gradients and sources of off-resonance can, can give rise to both signal overlaps and signal voids. Uh, one solution is high bandwidth imaging. Higher bandwidth imaging will mean that uh, in the, even in the presence of off-resonance, whether it's chemical shift or induced from, a, from an implant, uh, the, the spatial misregistration will be smaller, so higher bandwidth imaging can help. Uh, and spin echoes can also help because they're good at dealing with uh, sources of off-resonance. Uh, one of the last artifacts we'll talk about is gradient nonlinearity. Uh, the basic assumption in MRI is that the Z component of the B field created by the gradient coils varies linearly with X, Y, or Z over the field of view. Uh, higher gradient amplitudes and slew rates can be achieved by compromising on spatial linearity. And that's to say that as manufacturers try to generate systems that have really high performance gradient systems, very high gradient amplitudes, very fast slew rates, they may have to give up a little bit on the absolute linearity of the systems as an engineering and cost uh, considerations come into play. Uh, the problem is that gradient nonlinearity causes geometric and intensity distortions uh, because the, the, the assumption of a linear mapping is no longer actually valid.
And so here's an example of what, uh, what actually happens even on high performance uh, systems that we use today. The left hand image is an uncorrected uh, image and it appears pretty warped, uh, especially if you look at uh, the region of the, the legs and the thighs down here. You'll see both the sort of pinching of the anatomy, which looks anatomically unrealistic, and you'll see some intensity uh, um, amplification here in particular where signals sort of being uh, collected or piled up uh, and perhaps some, uh, some similar distortions towards the, the top here as well. Uh, the distortions made more obvious when you see the undistorted image. And so by mapping and understanding the nonlinearities in the spatial representation of the acquired images, we can warp uh, the images. This is system specific parameters allow us to uh, unwarp the images, if you will. And you'll notice that the anatomy of the legs now looks a little bit more regular. The intensity modulation has been smoothed out uh, both here in the legs as well as uh, higher up in the chest. Uh, and so uh, this is a, a post-processing technique that's used on almost all modern systems. And one way to identify or notice that gradient warping is being applied is if you look at the edges of the field of view, you'll see uh, that there's absolutely no signal intensity represented here. It's not noise, there's no signal, it's just perfectly uh, zero or perfectly black. And that's because as a consequence of warping the image, there was no imaging information to fill in here because there's no extrapolation being used. Uh, and so it just gives you, it's sort of a trick for identifying that, that gradient warping uh, was applied uh, because the underlying system itself had some nonlinearities uh, in it. So the overall solution is, as I said, image warping parameters that are system specific and applied to all images. This works well qualitatively. It corrects the overall uh, anatomy and geometric fidelity of the system. Uh, but this could be problematic for more quantitative approaches uh, if, if uh, sort of more care isn't done in exactly how the MR signals are handled. So that was a brief discussion of several artifacts that occur in MR imaging. There's a, a rich history of lots and lots of possible artifacts uh, in MR, but this at least gets you going. Thank you.